Hello everyone and welcome to this week's OpenGL 3D game tutorial and this week we're going to be continuing on with implementing shadows which is something that we actually started in the last tutorial so if you haven't seen that yet I would suggest watching that video first. So last time we created the shadow map by rendering the scene from the light's perspective using orthographic projection and this week we're going to be sampling that shadow map when we render our terrain to find out which parts of the terrain are hidden from the light and should therefore be in the shade. If you remember from last week, the way that we're going to do this is that for each fragment on the terrain, we're going to transform that fragment into shadow map space to find out where on the shadow map it would be. And then we can very simply sample the depth value at that position on the shadow map and compare it to the terrain fragment's depth to find out which is closer to the light. So all we've really got left to work out now is how to find out where on the shadow map a terrain pixel would be. To do this, we just need to have a look at how we determined the position for the entities on the shadow map last week, because in order to render the entities to the shadow map, we first had to determine their position on the shadow map. And we can see that calculation right here in the shadow vertex shader. So to convert a vertex into shadow map space, we multiplied the vertex position by the object's model matrix, the light's view matrix, and that orthographic projection matrix. So that's exactly what we're going to do to convert a terrain vertex into shadow map space. We'll multiply it with the terrain's model matrix, the light view matrix, and that orthographic projection matrix that we use to render the shadow map, and that will give us the position of the terrain's vertex on the shadow map. However, it will give us the position in this coordinate system here, and seeing as we want to use the coordinates to sample a texture, we need to use this coordinate system here. So we're also going to be doing a simple conversion between the two systems. This part of the transformation is actually provided as a matrix in the shadow map master renderer class by this method here, and you can see that this returns the light's view matrix multiplied by the orthographic projection matrix with that conversion offset already applied. So all we need to do in the terrain shader is to multiply that matrix with the terrain's model matrix and vertex position, and once we've done that we'll have the coordinates for the terrain's vertex on the shadow map in the x and y components and in the Z component, we'll have the depth value of the vertex relative to the light, which basically represents the distance of that terrain vertex from the light source. So let's get into the code, and I'm just going to comment out the GUI which was showing the shadow map last week, because we don't need that anymore. And we're going to start off in the terrain vertex shader. So the first thing we need is a uniform variable for the matrix, which holds the first part of that shadow space transformation. And we're going to be outputting the coordinates of this terrain vertex on the shadow map and that's going to be a vec4 called shadow chords. Uh, so let's now calculate those coordinates and as I explained earlier that's the first part of the transformation multiplied by the model matrix and the vertex position which we already have in the world position vector here so let's multiply those together and that will calculate those shadow coordinates. Let's now do the usual thing in the terrain shader class so I'm just going to zoom through this really quickly so we need a, uh, an int to hold the location of the uniform variable. We then need to get the location of the uniform variable, making sure to spell the uniform name correctly. And of course, we need a method which will allow us to load up that matrix to the terrain vertex shader. And we're going to be doing that once per frame. And again, this matrix uh, can be used to transform a vertex position from world space into shadow map space. So basically to where it is on the shadow map. So in the terrain renderer we need to load up that matrix so we need to take it in uh, into the render method and then we're going to load it straight up to the shader so that will happen once every frame and that will give us an error in the master renderer now. So in the master renderer when we call the terrain renderer dot render method we need to put in that transformation matrix and we can get that from the shadow map master renderer. Let's now move into the terrain fragment shader and in here we need to take in those shadow chords which represent where this fragment is on the shadow map and we also need to be able to sample the shadow map so that we can compare depth values so we need a sampler 2d for the shadow map. So we can now calculate whether this terrain fragment can be seen by the light or whether it should be hidden by another object and therefore in the shade. First off we're going to sample the shadow map to find out the distance of the nearest object to the light and we're going to sample it at the coordinates that we calculated in the vertex shader. So that's the position of this terrain fragment on the shadow map. 
and we just need the R component there because that's where the depth information is stored. We're now going to create a float called light factor, which we're just going to use to indicate how light this bit of the terrain should be. And we're then going to check if this terrain fragment's Z position, so depth from the light, distance from the light, is greater than the nearest object to the light. And that would mean it would be behind some object. So if it is behind some object, then the light can't see this terrain fragment. And so the light factor should be dimmed. And I'm going to write it as 1 minus 0 0.4 for now and uh, you'll see it will just make things a bit easier later. And we're now going to apply that light factor to the total diffuse lighting value. So we now need to go once again into the terrain shader class and do the usual thing for the shadow map sampler 2D uniform. So let's get the location of the shadow map uniform variable in the usual way and make sure to spell it correctly. And we now need to load up an int to that sampler 2D to indicate which text unit it should be sampling from. And we're going to be binding the shadow map to text unit 5. So we need to load up a 5 to the shadow map sampler. In the master renderer, we're going to bind the shadow map every frame in the prepare method so that it's bound before we render the scene. And we need to activate text unit 5 because that's where we're going to be binding the shadow map to. And we can then, now that the texture unit is active, we can bind the texture to it. And we of course want to bind the 2D texture that is the shadow map. So that should actually all be working now. And if we go ahead and run that, you should be able to see some shadows in the world. Obviously though, these shadows are far from perfect and we've still got a long way to go before they look acceptable. Firstly, you might notice that only the nearby objects are casting shadows, and if you want to change that, then you can increase the shadow distance value in the shadow box class. And this will increase the distance from the camera at which objects cast shadows, but unfortunately it will also lower the resolution of the shadows. The resolution can actually also be changed very easily by altering the shadow map size value in the shadow map master renderer. So I'm going to set this to 4096 for now, and as you can see, that improves the shadow quality quite a lot, but it's also much more expensive in terms of performance. So you're going to want to keep the shadow map size as low as possible. In the next tutorial, we'll actually be looking at other ways to improve the quality of the shadows without having to increase the resolution of the shadow map. The next obvious problem is the transition period between the area that's being rendered to the shadow map and the rest of the world. You can see that when the shadows cross this border, they go rather crazy, which is definitely not something that we want to see. And on one side of the world, there's actually just a massive band of ominous shadow. To fix this problem, we're going to be fading out the shadows as they get closer to that maximum shadow range to create a nice smooth transition. Doing that will hide the crazy transition glitch and it will also hide that big ominous dark area. So in the terrain vertex shader, we're going to calculate this transition. And first we need to set up two constant floats. Uh, the first one is the shadow distance, and this has to be the same as the shadow distance value in the shadow box. So I would really recommend you load that up as a uniform. Uh, I'm just being very lazy here and setting it as a constant. And we also need to determine the length of the transition period. Then down at the bottom, we're going to calculate the transition based on the distance of this vertex from the camera. And we have that value in the distance variable here. And we're going to calculate this in a very similar way to how we calculated the transition on the skybox. So we're first going to work out how far into the transition period the vertex is, uh, if it's in there at all. We're then going to normalize that to a value between 0 and 1. So 0 would be at the start of the transition period, and 1 would be at the end of the transition period. And we're then going to clamp it to a value between 0 and 1, and we're going to flip it. So everything before the transition period will have a value of 0, everything after will have a value of 1, everything in between will have something in between. And we're going to set this to the shadow coordinates W component, which we can then access in the terrain fragment shader. And we can use that value to determine how dark a shadow should be. So we're going to multiply it with the 0 0.4 here and that will hopefully fade out the shadows as they get further away from the camera. So if we have a look at the shadow for that willow tree there, as the camera gets further away, it fades out nicely uh, instead of doing that crazy transition that it was doing before. And also if we have a look around, you can see that that dark band of shadow is also now gone. The next problem with the shadows is that they don't deal with transparent textures at all. So when we have entities like these trees here, where a lot of the detail of the shape of the tree is provided by the transparency in the textures, 
we completely lose all of that in the shadows. All that we're rendering to the shadow map at the moment is the triangles of the model, and we're not discarding the transparent parts at all. So what we're going to do now is to sample the entity texture in the shadow fragment shader when we're drawing the entity to the shadow map, and we'll make sure that the transparent parts don't get drawn. So let's implement this in the code. So we're going to go into the shadow vertex shader, and we need to take in the texture coordinates of the model now. Uh, so we're going to take in a vec2 called in texture coordinates, and we're going to pass them straight to the shadow fragment shader. So we're going to output texture coordinates, and we're just going to set them to the in texture coordinates. And now in the shadow fragment shader, obviously we need to take in those vec2 texture chords. And with those texture coordinates, we're going to sample the model texture, which I've already got a sampler for. I put that in last week. Uh, so we need to get the alpha value from the texture. So we can do that by sampling the model texture. We're going to sample it at the texture coordinates. And we just need the alpha component here. And we're then going to test the alpha component to see if it's less than 0.5. And if it's less than 0.5, then we're going to discard this fragment because it's transparent. We now need to bind the texture coordinates in the VAO to the in texture chords variable. So in the shadow shader class, we're going to bind attribute one of the VAO, which is where the texture coordinates are stored. And we're going to bind them to that in texture chords variable. Make sure that this is spelt the same as you spelt it in the shadow vertex shader. And then if we go into the shadow map entity renderer, we need to enable attribute one of the VAO before we start rendering to allow those texture coordinates to be used. And then after rendering, we're going to disable it again. And for each model that we're rendering, we need to bind the model texture. So we're just going to bind to texture unit zero because that's the default texture unit. That's where the sampler will be sampling from. And to texture unit zero, we're going to be binding the 2D texture, which is the model's texture. And we can get that by doing model.getTexture.getTextureID. So let's go ahead and run that and hopefully we should now be able to see a bit more detail in the shadows. And as you can see um, from the shadows of the trees here, you can see that the transparency is now showing in those shadows. So we're almost done for this week now, but there are still a couple of little things that we can improve. One thing that you might occasionally notice is that when you're moving in the same direction as the light, it's possible that some shadows might disappear when they shouldn't. If you remember from last week, the area that gets rendered to the shadow map is carefully fit around the camera's view frustum. Objects on either side or in front of this area could never cast shadows into the camera's view frustum, but objects behind the shadow map area could. So an object positioned here should actually have a visible shadow, but because it's outside the shadow map area, it won't. To fix this, a slight offset has been added to the back section of the shadow map area to make sure that an object's shadows are outside of the camera's view frustum before they stop casting. There's no perfect distance that you can use to set this offset because if you have a really tall object or if the sun is really low in the sky, then there's always a chance for objects to have their shadows cut off. So you'll just have to try a few different settings until you find something satisfactory. Don't make the offset too big though, because that would cause the shadow map area to be a lot bigger and would therefore lower the resolution of the shadows. Finally, the last problem that you might notice is that the back faces of objects with transparency don't cast shadows. So to fix this, we need to disable back face culling before rendering to the shadow map. So let's do that quickly in the shadow map entity renderer. So for each model, we're going to check if that model's texture has transparency. And if it does, then we should disable backface culling. And we can do that by calling master renderer.disable culling. And after rendering all of the entities that use that texture, again, we need to check if that texture had transparency. And if it did, we need to enable backface culling again. And if we go ahead and run that now, you can see that that is now all working. So that is it for this week. Next time we're going to be looking at the problems of self-shadowing and improving the quality of our shadows. And that video will probably be out in two weeks time because I'm thinking of starting up an open AL audio tutorial series and I would then alternate each week between the two series. If you haven't seen this week's Equilinox devlog video about simulating evolution, then you can check that out. A link to that is on the screen now. But yeah, thank you guys very much for watching this video. Do subscribe if you haven't already. Have a fantastic week and I will see you all next time.